tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Over nine separate days, the VPD arrested 47 men. A firefighter and a school trustee among those arrested in a VPD sting targeting alleged sexual predators. Plus... Deadly morning. Two men shot and killed at separate hotels in Kamloops. And... There's no way that anybody should ever have to say, well, that damage is done. I say correct it. A call for change from the man who made the bombshell spending allegations against two legislature staffers. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We begin tonight with some disturbing allegations. A school trustee, a teacher and a firefighter are among 47 men arrested in a Vancouver police sting targeting alleged sexual predators. As the CBC's Tina Lovegreen reports, those charged are accused of trying to have sex with underage girls. The 47 men we arrested are from all walks of life, ethnicity, education and employment. Of those men, seven of them have been charged. These are the names, ages ranging from 24 to 68 years old. Among them is former Vancouver School Board trustee Ken Clement. He resigned from the position last June, citing personal reasons. Today, the school board says the district was not made aware of the arrest and was never notified by the VPD. This is extremely troubling. Retired teacher Nick Diaz has also been charged. He taught at the all-girls private school Little Flower Academy. A similar statement from the academy's principal. The school has not been notified by the police or anyone else. And the news is shocking. The sting ran over a period of several months last year. With Vancouver police posting ads online posing as women selling sex. And when potential clients responded, they were told the girl was underage, in some cases just 15 years old. They would agree on the act, they'd agree on the, the fee and the location. When the men showed up at the hotels, they were confronted by police. You had everything from people that would basically acquiesce and others that would fight. Some dismissed the officers, some told them to actually go out and find criminals to arrest. Police say most respondents turned down the offer after finding out the girl was underage, but dozens still accepted the offer. Discovered that the, the person they were communicating with or believed the person they were communicating with was underage, they were more excited about that. Criminal defense lawyer Lawrence Myers warns that these are just allegations which have not been proven in court. We must be reluctant to rush to judgment. We with, must withhold judgment entirely. There is a presumption of innocence. But advocates for the rights of sex workers say the investigation is encouraging. I'm really, you know, I'm grateful that they're willing to go to these lengths to try to support us in fighting for um, respect and and safety in the sex industry in Vancouver. The VPD is working with Crown to lay charges in the remaining 40 arrests. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. And two men have been killed in separate shootings at Kamloops hotels. No arrests have been made and it's not clear if the cases are even connected. For more on this, we are joined live by CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett. Dan, police say this is a very dynamic situation. And they have a lot of work to do, Anita. Police were called to the Super 8 Motel in Valley View just before 7 this morning. The victim was lying outside on the ground. He was rushed to Royal Inland Hospital and later died. Two hours after he was found, Mounties found a second man hurt outside the Comfort Inn on Rogers Place, about 10 kilometers from that first hotel. He died in hospital as well. The ER at Royal Inland was restricted for some time as doctors and nurses were working. Kamloops Mounties closed several roads around the shooting scenes as well. They say they don't yet know if these killings are connected, but they are treating the deaths as homicides. They have not released the victims' names yet. The force plans to hold a news conference tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. in Kamloops. They're asking anyone who knows anything about the shootings or sees something suspicious to give them a call, and we'll have the latest for you tonight at 11. Anita, Mike, Dan Burrett reporting live tonight. Thanks. An officer-involved shooting in Kelowna is now under investigation by BC's Independent Investigations Office. It happened earlier this afternoon in the parking lot outside of the Orchard Park Shopping Centre. IIO is expected to be on scene later this evening. Tune in to CBC Vancouver News at 11 with Dan for the latest on this story. Closing arguments in the trial of Lisa Batstone wrapped up in BC Supreme Court in New Westminster this afternoon. 
Batstone was charged with second-degree murder after the body of her eight-year-old daughter, Tegan, was found in the back of her hatchback in December of 2014. She'd been smothered with a plastic bag. Defense and Crown agree Lisa Batstone killed her, but disagree on whether there was intent to kill. Crown argues there was, but defense said Batstone was suffering from mental illness at the time and should be convicted of manslaughter, not second-degree murder. Judge Catherine Murray said it's a difficult decision, which will be delivered on March 22nd. A man convicted of killing his common-law wife almost 25 years ago has been granted bail by a B.C. Supreme Court judge. Wade Skiffington has maintained his innocence in the 1994 murder of Wanda Martin in Richmond. The young woman was found dead in an apartment with her young son. She had been shot six times. Skiffington was found guilty based on a confession to undercover police as part of a so-called Mr. Big operation. The judge today said Skiffington would have been released on parole four years ago had he not continued to proclaim his innocence. Police in New Westminster have released new video of a hit and run that sent a 67-year-old woman to hospital as they continue to search for the driver responsible. And a quick warning, the video is pretty disturbing. It was taken by a transit bus camera and shows the entire incident. The woman was hit while crossing 6th Avenue at 7th Street by a white Cadillac making that left turn. As she lays motionless in the street, the driver stops their car and runs to her side as another vehicle stops as well. The driver then left the scene before first responders arrived to transport the woman to hospital. U.S. police are urging that driver of the white Cadillac CTS to come forward and asking anyone else who saw what happened to give them a call. We're hearing now for the first time from the man behind that bombshell B.C. legislature spending report, Speaker Daryl Plekis. It comes the same day as calls for his predecessor to step aside from her current role. Our provincial affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher with the latest. This is an outrageously complicated situation. And Speaker Daryl Plekis addressed that complicated situation for the first time at an unrelated event in Abbotsford. He spoke about the criticism he received for not providing more information sooner about why he triggered the suspensions of the clerk and sergeant at arms. It is pretty hard to go around the community and everybody looks at you as though you're a cancer on society. And yet almost overnight, he's gone from villain to hero. Uh, he has sh shed a light on something that all British Columbians are startled and disgusted by, and I think that's a good thing. This is also the first time we're hearing from Premier John Horgan since the report was made public on Monday. Clearly, it speaks to the need for uh, further audits. I know the Legislative Assembly Management Committee will be working on that. The big question now is just how far back the expense scandal goes. Hugh Linda Reid, who served as Speaker from 2013 to 2017. She's currently a Liberal MLA and Assistant Deputy Speaker. Reid responded today with a written statement, which reads, in part, As the auditor conducts their investigation, I will make myself fully available. I will work with the auditor and any other investigators to ensure the protection of taxpayer dollars. I feel it's important to respect the process of the current investigations in order to ensure the public is provided with a full account of the entire situation. But the NDP is demanding more more answers from her. I would say how did you sit there silently while this activity went on around you? What did you know? When did you know it? And what did you do about it? The Greens are going one step further calling on Reid to step aside from her role as Assistant Deputy Speaker. She has been named in the report by Mr. Plekis as being uh, in charge at the time when a number of these issues are going forward. But right now in the BC Legislature, I do not know who to trust. I can only imagine what British Columbians are thinking. But as we wait on both an audit and an RCMP investigation, the man who started it all suggests there may be more still to come. There is definitely more to come here. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, it has been 15 years of conversations, drawings and meetings, along with years of fundraising. Now one family is handing over $40 million for the new Vancouver Art Gallery. But as the CBC's Zara Premji explains, it's a big boost, but it still isn't enough. It's been years in the making. And it'll still be many more until you see this new $350 million design of the Vancouver Art Gallery come to realization at the corner of West Georgia and Canby Street. We would like to start break, breaking ground um, at the end of this year or the beginning of 2020. And the project usually takes about three years uh, for construction. 
But the Vancouver Art Gallery says it's miles ahead now after a gift said to be the largest ever single private donation to arts and culture organizations in B.C. $40 million from the Chan family, buying them the name for the new building, the Chan Centre for the Visual Arts. And not the first building to bear their name. Philanthropy and better our communities. It's, it's a philosophy that's been in our uh, family for multiple generations. In 1997, the Chan family donated the Chan Centre for the Performing Arts at UBC. And this new donation comes from a desire to encourage more arts platforms in Vancouver. It's really going to be like the center for civic life, and so um, that, that's immense, you know. Our city needs that. Our city needs more places to connect. The search for money is not over yet, though. If you feel like, you know, uh, up in the donation or encouraging some of your friends to pitch in, that's, that's always encouraged. The gallery has been working to raise $100 million from the private sector, and with the announcement of the Chan family's donation, it only puts the total funds raised from that sector at $85 million. And when the money eventually comes, the Vancouver Art Gallery says it'll take at least three years to see the new building pop up. While the idea started in 2004, when asked whether it's possible the long-awaited project won't go ahead, the answer is simply put. Oh no, that's not a possibility. Okay. okay. I can tell okay. you that. That's not a possibility. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, TransLink will throw its weight behind a SkyTrain extension to UBC at a Mayor's Council meeting tomorrow. A report shows extending the Millennium Line would actually be the most effective long-term transit plan for that corridor. As John Hernandez reports, it might cost more than buses and LRT, but capacity makes it the winner. Every three minutes, students load up onto the 99B line at UBC. Some commute longer than others, but most agree there's something missing at this busy transit hub. The SkyTrain seems to be everywhere except going to UBC. A SkyTrain to UBC has been talked about for years and it's slowly inching towards reality. Plans are in motion to extend the Millennium Line from VCC Clark to Arbutus Street. And in a new report, TransLink says it makes sense to keep moving west. Now that we're building to Arbutus with a SkyTrain, we understand the kinds of ridership volume that will be then um, spit out at the end of that station. TransLink expects there will be up to 120,000 passengers that travel between Arbutus and UBC each day by 2045. The report suggests the volume could only logistically be served by a SkyTrain, ruling out both light rail transit and more buses. The report will go before the TransLink Mayor's Council tomorrow. Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart is already in favour. So it makes sense that we're just running folks out to UBC rather than having them get on a bus or some other kind of transport. But how much would it cost? If it were built today, TransLink says it would cost up to $3.8 billion. That number will increase with inflation. Some critics say the dollars should instead be spread out across the region and put toward cheaper transit options like LRT. A more even distribution of services across the metropolitan region makes more sense than just having all your money spent on one corridor in, in, in Vancouver. But TransLink says employment and population growth in the area makes it a priority. It's the second busiest transit corridor in BC and already way over capacity. We're running buses every three minutes, 60 foot buses. We have pass ups all the time. You cannot run them any faster. If the mayor's council gets on board, TransLink will move towards drafting up a business plan. It will then look to secure funding from all levels of government. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Vancouver police are looking for a driver who caused extensive damage by doing donuts on the grass at Vanier Park. Have a look. Police got a 911 call at about 2.30 a.m. Sunday. The caller reported a dark-colored SUV driving recklessly on the grass at the park. When officers arrived, the driver took off through the park and escaped. The officers didn't give chase for safety reasons caused a significant uh, amount of damage. Um, there's animals in the area there, there's people that are out of the park running at night. Um, it's very irresponsible and we're asking the people now that they've had some time to think about it, they've made a mistake, give the police a call. And police say the driver could be facing a mischief charge for the damage done at the park. In a tweet, the park board said staff will break up the loose grass there and fill in any low spots. The area will be reseeded in a few months from now. And crews rushed to contain a dark discharge that spilled into the Burrard Inlet this morning after a water main break on Waterfront Street. 
The city of Vancouver says it's been told, well, mostly mud that flowed into the inlet, and that spill has now been contained. The broken main also flooded nearby streets and parking lots, but the city says the impact on this evening's commute should be minimal. Amy's here now with our first look at the forecast. I think we can all agree that was uh, that was a stunner today for the most part. I it wasn't get bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we started off much more stunning than we ended up. Unfortunately, we had a lot of low-lying cloud roll in, and then it stuck around. We just don't have the winds to really push it aside and it's just been this sort of stagnant air mass so unfortunately we are going to continue to see that overnight and as we see the temperature dropping we'll see a bit more moisture coming in and we will see some of that very almost heavy fog and drizzle uh, but we will not see any significant pe uh, precipitation for quite a few days so there's that at least uh, right now we're looking at six degrees of Vancouver so certainly a little bit warmer today than it was this time yesterday but tomorrow will be a bit chillier just by a degree or two and that's just because we have this sort of cooler air mass uh, hanging down low with that low cloud if you get above the clouds in some areas with the North Shore Burnaby Mountain uh, and over on Vancouver Island thing is do look much different but yes we are unfortunately going to see things staying a little bit uh, dreary, uh, drearier than we thought for the next couple of days. Overnight, we will see those clouds uh, sort of thickening up, and then it's just a chance of drizzle, but enough that I wanted to put it in because it can cause things to become a little bit slippery for your commutes uh, and just something to be aware of. It does reduce visibility. So we'll see that chance of drizzle on and off overnight and in through the first half of tomorrow. Could see it in the afternoon, but I think what we'll really see is just that lower marine cloud lingering. Friday is looking to be about the same. We'll see a few little brighter breaks, and then we'll have fog on Saturday. And once that dissipates, we'll finally get into that sunshine on Sunday. But I'll have a full forecast for the entire province coming up in just a few minutes. Always love a good foggy morning. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> You're welcome. And just a reminder, you can also watch CBC Vancouver News at 6 and go in-depth on our stories online at cbc.ca slash bc. Yeah, we're also streaming this newscast live and on demand on both Facebook and YouTube, where you can also watch us on television commercial free. Well, how do you use house a workforce in a city that's seeing surging rental prices and an ever increasing demand? We take you to Whistler, where they've taken a unique approach coming up. And good evening if you're watching online. Well, Johanna may not be here this week, but Wagstaff Wednesdays, well, it must go on. Yes. <laughs> For tonight's edition, she brings us an update on the ozone. And while its status in recent years has been worrisome, the latest news is a little more encouraging. Some good news when it comes to protecting our delicate ozone layer. A new report shows that it's finally starting to heal from the damage caused by harmful chemicals. Here's how it breaks down. In the northern hemisphere and mid-latitude regions, recovery has progressed at a rate of about 1 to 3 percent a decade since 2000. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but that means the ozone layer should completely heal in those areas by 2030s if the current rates are sustained. Now, over the southern hemisphere and in the more problematic polar regions, recovery will take longer. Here you can see the ozone layer in blue and purple in the year 2000 and then 2018. It's a much more subtle difference. Recovery will take till 2060. The measures taken to repair the damage will also have an important beneficial effect on climate change as some of the gases that cause the ozone layer to thin and in places disappear also contribute to the warming of the atmosphere. So phasing them out could avoid as much as 0.5 degrees Celsius of warming this century. The results were presented as part of a four-year assessment of the health of the ozone layer. And they represent a rare instance of global environmental damage being repaired, a victory for concerted global action by governments. Ozone in the upper layers of the atmosphere protects the Earth's surface from most of the harmful UV rays from the sun. Scientific evidence of the depletion of the ozone layer over Antarctica was first presented in 1985. It was 1987 the Montreal Protocol was signed, binding world governments to reduce and phase out the harmful chemicals. The Montreal Protocol is one of the most successful multilateral agreements in history, a mix of authoritative science and collaborative action that has defined the protocol for more than 30 years. Now, it's not all good news. The report also found an increase of harmful emissions coming from Eastern Asia, but the Chinese government has pledged to find and close down those sites. 
The Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol coming into effect at the start of next year will help reduce future climate change by targeting HFC gases, mostly used in refrigeration, which have a warming effect tens of thousands of times greater than carbon dioxide. So stay tuned. And now you're Science Smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. Good to have some good news about the environment. Yes, it is, for sure. Had a lot of bad yeah. news. Lately. And as she said, uh, if you have any questions, tweet her. She'll try to answer them. <laughs> right? Yes, and uh, we won't be able to answer them no. probably, but they're going for her. And we'll be back with more on today's top stories in just a few moments. Subsidized housing for half the people living in a community, completely immune from speculation. It's something a lot of BC cities would like, but only one place has actually done it. Our Justin McElroy is on the road again tonight, taking a look at Whistler's unique housing model. When most people think about this town, this comes to mind. But for politicians, it's about affordable housing. This week we're in Whistler, and whether the town's approach to finding ways that people in town can stay here can be replicated in other BC cities. Just south of the iconic village is Chuckmas Creek, where hundreds and hundreds of units of housing is under construction or planned. But unlike most cities, this is all overseen by the municipal government. We have to bite into the idea. You know, you're not gonna make a pile of money, that's fine. All your basics, dishwasher, microwave, etc. After the Olympics, Colin Pitt-Taylor bought his two-bedroom apartment for half of what it would go for on the open market. Over half of Whistler's permanent population lives in subsidized housing built in the last 20 years. They've been doing a really good job of housing as many people as they can at affordable prices, either rental or purchase, and uh, it's kind of been a boon to locals who want to stay here because real estate prices have always been a little out of reach for a lot of people that are living and working here. Here's how it works. The government builds on lands it owns. It sells only to people who work at least part-time in Whistler and don't own any other property. And when they want to sell, it's done through the housing authority, which places a cap on the price tied to inflation. I probably am inundated with calls from other municipalities right across North America on a weekly basis. With high demand in an isolated area, what works in Whistler can't be directly cloned. But the housing authority's head says the general principles can be. Our growth management cap um, and strategies that we have in Whistler is unique to our community. But the strategies that we've applied for addressing our housing shortage, that's transferable to other communities. The authority is so entrenched that new Mayor Jack Crompton didn't face any competition last election. In the midst of a province-wide housing crisis, he says other mayors are calling him up. I think that that's what is so interesting for us, to look around this province and not see more communities doing the same thing is a little surprising at times. Because for us, it just took a group of people in the 90s to say, this is crucial for the success of our community. And that's the biggest reminder for other municipalities thinking of joining Whistler. It takes a long time to build up the housing, to build up the stock, and to make it part of the political culture. It's not a downhill sprint, but a steady upward climb. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Whistler. from Canada's ambassador to China are raising eyebrows tonight as the diplomatic feud between the two countries drags on. Critics say he went too far and that his comments are more political than dramatic. And as Katie Simpson reports, some are even calling for him to lose his job. Got a big crowd here today. Only news outlets with a primarily Chinese audience were invited to the ambassador's Q&A session. Over 40 minutes, John McCallum advocated for Meng Wanzhou's release, along with the two detained Canadians. Well, my hope is that that will be the outcome, but it is not something that I necessarily control. 
His shockingly candid remarks went even further when he questioned the U.S. for requesting the Huawei executive's extradition. I never expected that we would have this problem uh, thrown at us. I cannot speak for the motives of the United States. You'd have to ask Donald Trump or someone in the U.S. government. The prime minister was careful with his words, dodging questions on whether he shares the ambassador's opinion. We will ensure as a government and as a country uh, that all the rules and the independence of our justice system is properly defended and properly supported. Canada has said all along, this is a legal matter, a position that was undermined when President Donald Trump said last month he'd be willing to use the arrest as a bargaining chip in his trade war with China, drawing accusations Meng's arrest was politically motivated. McCallum's comments yesterday don't help matters, according to one former ambassador, who says it appears McCallum went rogue. Mr. McCallum should have uh, shown uh, more restraint and not uh, immiss himself in uh, an already very complicated uh, judicial uh, process. But not everyone in the diplomatic community agrees. He certainly did it because uh, he was acting on instruction, instruction from the government to be able to soothe the tension and perhaps even act as Canada is victim in all of this. The opposition says decisive action needs to be taken. It's hard for me to see uh, the, the, the value added that, uh, that the ambassador has uh, added to this scenario. If I were prime minister, I would fire John McCallum. The CBC's Katie Simpson reporting tonight from Ottawa. Fluoridated drinking water has long been credited with lowering levels of tooth decay in kids. But fewer than half of Canadian cities have it in their water. In fact, many have been removing the substance. But as Vicodopia explains, there are signs that trend is changing. Take your tongue out for me. Windsor dentists have been seeing the signs for a few years now. More children with bad teeth. More cavities at a younger age and bigger cavities at a younger age. Bigger cavities. So larger cavities, more advanced decay at a younger age. Windsor stopped putting fluoride in its water six years ago. Public health officials say serious tooth decay has since soared by 50%. The rate of urgent dental care is now twice as high as the rest of Ontario. Yemi Kalito's two oldest kids were raised on fluoridated water and both have healthy teeth, but the two youngest weren't and had to be treated for serious tooth decay. Same, uh, you know, oral hygiene, but you can see the difference between, you know, all four of them. Last month, City Council voted to put fluoride back into its water supply, but that hasn't ended debate in Windsor. I don't believe in it. It's just more chemicals we don't need. I think they should put it back. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's good for you is it can't hurt you. A recent Canadian review of dozens of major studies concluded that water fluoridation is safe at the current recommended levels and that there are no serious health risks and children have the most to benefit and yet almost two-thirds of Canadians no longer have fluoride added to their municipal water. In BC, Yukon, Quebec, New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Labrador, less than 3% of the population has fluoride added to their municipal water. In Manitoba, Ontario and the NWT, it's between 60 and 70%. Trying to add fluoride to water in Canada has been contentious from the start. It seems almost too easy to be true. The debate hasn't stopped. I still believe that this is mass medication without consent. Like Windsor, Calgary is also seeing a spike in kids' cavities after removing fluoride. Researchers say low-income families are affected most. It's been a long-standing debate everywhere. It's a fear of, quote, chemicals, which unfortunately have become synonymous with toxin or poison. In Windsor, the fluoride hasn't been added back yet. The plan still has to be approved by a neighbouring town council. Mass medicating the entire water supply for the benefit of very few uh, is not the right thing to do. But Windsor's mayor, who opposed fluoridation, questions whether local politicians are even qualified to decide. If there is a health benefit that's legitimate and real uh, in fluoride in the water, it should be decided and mandated by the province of Ontario and all provinces across Canada for that matter. That's not the case. They leave the decision to people like me with no science background. For pro-fluoride advocates, it can't be added back to the water soon enough. Vicodopia, CBC News, Windsor, Ontario.
It's a language that is universal. How two chefs from opposite ends of the globe are making connections over their shared passion, food. That's next. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. Last year, our detectives began a sting, an undercover operation, to proactively target adults seeking or willing to purchase the sexual services of people under the age of 18. A school teacher and a firefighter are among 47 arrested in a VPD operation targeting alleged sexual predators. The two-month sting targeted people allegedly willing to pay teenagers for sex acts through online ads. There's no evidence to indicate the men knew each other, and police say they come from all walks of life. It was a deadly morning in Kamloops with two men shot and killed at two separate hotels in the city. Mounties have yet to make any arrests, and it's not clear if the shootings are connected. That means police aren't saying whether there is a risk to the public. And more blowback at the B.C. Legislature. B.C. Liberal MLA Linda Reid being called to step down for her role in the growing expense scandal. On Monday, a scathing report called into question the expenses of Sergeant-at-Arms Gary Lenz and Clerk of the House Craig James. Both men were suspended back in November. Both deny all wrongdoing.
We're also hearing from the man behind that explosive report. Daryl Plekis spoke on camera for the first time since putting forward the allegations of questionable spending. At one point, the House Speaker described his first day in office and the, quote, surprising trappings he was greeted with. Well, I, I was standing in front of my executive assistant and she's and I opened, uh, I noticed there was a jug of water with an ice bucket behind it and flowers and I said, what's that all about? And she said, oh, Mr. Speaker, we refresh those flowers for you every week and we refresh that jug of water for you in the ice twice a day. I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. And then I opened the cabinet it was sitting on, it was filled with all kinds of booze noticed an expensive bottle of scotch and she said well you know if that isn't good enough for you mr speaker we will make sure that uh, it's properly stocked for you and then uh, went on to see that other cupboards were full as well well vancouver is in the midst of the city's biggest food festival of the festival of the year <laughs> dine out it is typically a chance for diners to check out restaurants at a reduced price. But as Leanne Rung shows us tonight, the event is also looking to put Vancouver on the culinary map. Say the Arctic cha. A walk through Granville Island is fun for any foodie. Leave two world-class chefs in there and... It's like kids in a toy story. I mean, you can actually leave us here and come back tomorrow. We'll not be bored. We'll Vancouver's Edgar Cano is playing host to Sydney's Francesco Minnelli. Though they live oceans apart, they've been brought together for a collaboration dinner and a shared purpose. Our job is like this, never stop learning. So I'm glad that I have this kind of opportunity. There are differences, but for the Italian-Australian who's in Canada for the first time, notable similarities. Uh, it's a mix of culture as well here with the Asian and a bit of a European as well, so it's great. And his guy might be the peak representation of Vancouver's meld of cultures. German-educated Mexican-raised Kano is Japanese, and both are fishermen who have a keen interest in the sustainability of sea life around their port cities. What we're doing uh, right now or today, it's not for us. It's for our kids, it's for the future generation, so that they can still enjoy cooking, still enjoy fishing in the future. The chef exchange happening here is just one event in a much larger festival put on by Tourism Vancouver. Dine Out Vancouver involves now 300 restaurants who are putting out menus from $15 to $45, all in an effort to put Vancouver on the culinary map. We have local and sustainable ingredients. We have a number of different multicultural influences that all blend together to create something that's very unique in the world. And all of these chefs will take that story back to their uh, respective cities. In a typically slow time of year, the hope is this will generate a bump in traffic for the restaurant, hotel and taxi industry. But in the long run, another page in Vancouver's culinary story. So if you guys had one word to describe this whole experience, how would you describe it? One word. Collaboration. International collaboration. All right, thank you. Thank you. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. Super hungry now. Well, at 637, <laughs> here's a live look at uh, BC Place. Looking east tonight, a mixed bag today. Some sun, some clouds. So how's the weekend shaping up? Amy Bell is back with the answer next.
Well, the iconic East Van Cross may be on the move after the city conditionally approved construction of a 10-story building next to the public art piece. City staff say the building will obstruct the view of the cross from some angles. Concerns were first raised last October by Ken Lum, the monument's artist and East Vancouver residents. They argued public art should be protected. Eric Fredrickson, the city's public art program manager, says a decision about whether to piece, the piece will be moved will come in the next few months. So Mike says it was beautiful outside today. I did not get outside. It really depends on where you were. Well, I was on a little, uh, I was on assignment today mm -hmm. uh, right. over on the island, yes, so it was, quite lovely uh, it was beautiful. Yeah. Yes, yeah. We, we didn't get that so much, unfortunately. <laughs> Which is why I stayed inside. Yeah, yeah, it ended up being a lot more sort of glum than we were hoping for. It started off with so much promise, though. We brightened up very early on and we had lots of sunshine, and then it all sort of quickly uh, dissipated as we saw a lot of low cloud coming in. So you can sort of see uh, between 7 and 9 is when we really saw the brightest weather. It was gorgeous, it was a great sunrise. And then, yeah, we saw that breeze just dying right down. And unfortunately, that allowed some clouds to sneak in right from the Fraser Valley. And they just sort of lingered all day. So it was a very, very... Uh calm day and without that wind to sort of push things aside we just saw that low level cloud lingering and unfortunately we're going to see that pattern continuing over the next uh, day at least perhaps even longer you can see this cloud cover but these winds barely generating anything enough to really scrub that air so uh, that's the trade-off if you get above that low-lying cloud though you will see things a little bit brighter as we saw uh, some areas of Vancouver Island today and then of course if you get up above the clouds into the mountains of the North Shore Mountains, we're even a little bit brighter today. Uh, we will see a bit of a drizzle, and not quite light rain, but just some drizzle on that sort of heavy, thick fog in many areas for tomorrow. So it will be a little bit uh, depressing at times. Uh, over the sort of northern half of Vancouver Island, you're looking a lot brighter, though. You'll see a mix of sun and cloud for Tofino. Uh, coming down to Victoria, though, you will be dealing with that drizzle once again. Whistler, uh, we're seeing mainly cloudy conditions, but enough uh, sunshine to really make things lovely. And then just a few showers out in Abbotsford, and we'll see the temperature a little bit cooler than we saw today, just as we see that sort of cooler and wet air mass above us. Uh, we'll see a few flurries in Dees Lake and some showers for Prince Rupert and Victoria, as I mentioned. Gorgeous day, though, really, as you come into the uh, south and central interior and the Kootenays, a mix of sun and cloud. Cranbrook could get a little dusting, just some very light flurries, but all in all, looking great for that area of the province. Five-day forecast, unfortunately, we've taken away some of that sunshine, so we are are seeing things a little bit cloudy uh, and drizzly for tomorrow and then we'll see those clouds sticking around for Friday uh, Saturday will be a very foggy one unfortunately and then we'll see that burning up and then we will see or burning away I should say nothing will be burning up on Saturday but then we'll get back into some sunshine for Sunday and a bit more cloud on Monday I'm loving that fog on Saturday you even like I love that waking fog, I love waking up to it it's so beautiful it inside. is actually quite lovely so yeah you'll enjoy that very good. Thanks, Thanks very Eric. Much. You're welcome. Anger and violence in Venezuela today. Hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets calling for change. How one man declared himself president after the break.
My name is Chastity Davis and I'm sole proprietor of my own consulting business. I do a lot of advocacy work for Indigenous women. Pretty exciting to be recognized on the top 40 under 40 in Vancouver. I think it's important for CBC Vancouver to support the 40 under 40 list as we are the up and coming leaders and be in the know of what's happening in that generation. Thank you CBC Vancouver for being a part of my community. Hundreds of thousands took to the streets across Venezuela today to protest against the presidency of Nicolas Maduro. Authorities say at least seven people were killed today, but as Paul Hunter tells us, despite the protests, the president is not backing down. Hundreds of thousands strong demonstrators today in Caracas raged at the government of Nicolas Maduro. Pero se le acabó su tiempo, señor. Your time is up, she says. They're angry at a government that's effectively run this country into the ground. But government forces resisted the call for change fiercely. This video shows the body of a demonstrator killed today in San Cristobal, an opposition stronghold. Underlining a key barrier for demonstrators, military loyalty to the government. But amid all of that, a remarkable political declaration. Opposition leader Juan Guaido swore in himself as acting president, recognized almost instantly by Canada, Brazil, Argentina and others, most significantly the United States. Said Donald Trump this afternoon, everything, even military action, is available to now force Maduro out of office. All options, always, all options are on the table. La independencia, la soberanía. But indeed, for now, Maduro remains in the presidential palace. His response to Trump, all U.S. personnel have been given 72 hours to leave the country. But tonight, the U.S. said it may defy that order. So, now what? On those streets today, demonstrators came across a wall of government police. First, they threw rocks, but then sent a call for courage, arguing that true loyalty is to Venezuela. Join us, they chanted. A woman went nose to nose with them and begged, please help us, she said, and then broke down in tears. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. And as the situation in Venezuela plays out, whose side the military takes will be key to the battle. One colonel may be on the wrong side for now, so his family was forced to flee Venezuela. As Evan Dyer tells us, now they call Canada home. Paranoia is running higher than ever in the Maduro government since somebody attempted to kill Nicolas Maduro with a drone in August. Maduro accused fugitive Colonel Oswaldo Garcia Palomo of directing that and other plots against him. Le habla el Coronel Osvaldo Valentín García Palomo. García Palomo has enraged the Maduro regime by sending audio messages to his former comrades in arms, telling them to refuse to obey orders to attack protesters. His family home in Venezuela was ransacked by military intelligence hunting the colonel. His daughter Fabiola escaped. So I just escaped through a window and then I jumped off a mountain, and it was like, like I was a fugitive, a fugitive you know, because I, I started to run. She was able to join her father, and together they fled overland to Colombia. His wife, Sorbaida Padilla, and their son Oswaldo Jr. suffered through four days of brutal interrogations. She says they were hooded, pepper sprayed till they choked, and given electric shocks. Other family members, even young Oswaldo's girlfriend, were brought to the detention center. Mm. All the moment they say that if I didn't cooperate with them and tell them where, is, where was my father. They will uh, raid my girlfriend and all my family. After four days, they were released. They immediately left the country and came to Canada. Eventually, Fabiola joined them in Montreal. Back home, the armed forces have seen waves of arrests. My husband is on the right side of history, says Padilla. He's still loyal to the oath he took the day he graduated military college. Soldiers must not repress their own people. And that's also the message coming from Juan Guaido. Hear us, Venezuelan soldier, he says. This is the moment to defend the Constitution, but also your own family and your own honor. Tough choices with serious consequences. 
for those who wear the uniform in Venezuela. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. An arrest has been made after an Arizona woman who was in an incapacitated state gave birth at a care facility. The suspect, a nurse who police say cared for her, appeared in court today. No direct evidence that Mr. Sutherland has committed these acts. Um, I know at this point there is DNA. Mr. Sutherland will have a right and have his own DNA expert. 36-year-old Nathan Sutherland, a licensed practical nurse, submitted his DNA sample yesterday under court order. The results came back a few hours later showing he was a match to the baby. A 29-year-old woman who has been unable to speak and has limited ability to move gave birth on December 29th. That immediately triggered reviews and police treated it as a sexual assault. The woman's family has said it will take care of the child. And earlier this month, we brought you a report on the Canadian government using social media influencers to help connect with younger people. Well, across the pond, the UK is getting stricter with how these influencers work. Mm -hmm. Some celebrities have been posting pictures of products on platforms like Instagram without making it clear they're being paid to do so. And as the CBC's Kayla Hounsel reports, the UK wants that to stop. It's pretty common, these so-called social media influencers, people who have a lot of followers online who are often paid to post content about certain products. The problem with that, says the UK's Competition and Markets Authority, is that it's not always clear when that content is an advertisement. So they're cracking down on that and asking these celebrities to be very clear and direct about their language. And they say it's not enough to see buried halfway down in a list of 30 hashtags we've all seen that a word like hashtag sponsored they say the language needs to be direct and noticeable from a quick glance and they're asking these celebrities to use direct words like ad or advertisement to indicate when they have been paid to post that content I say people might feel duped or misled if they've been following someone or taking a recommendation from someone they admire and then they find out that it was a marketing ploy. So, so far, 16 celebrities have voluntarily agreed to change their behavior and change the way that they post online. So we thought we'd ask some people here in London how much they pay attention to what these social media influencers are posting and whether they care if they've been upfront about whether their content is an advertisement. Here's what they had to say. Uh, it doesn't bother me either way. Like if they are getting paid, fine. If, if they want to say they're getting paid, fine. If they don't, then that's also fine. Uh, yeah, I think they should, they should definitely have to post um, if it's an advert. Yeah. Why do you think so? Uh, that's it's a bit disingenuous. I mean, you can tell it's mad anyway, but I think they definitely should need have to, and it's wrong if they don't. It's it's the same like any t TV uh, advertisement. Doesn't make a difference for me. So a variety of opinions there, and so far none of these celebrities that have been named have been charged for this kind of activity. As I say, they've all agreed to change their behavior voluntarily, but the UK Competition and Marketing Authority is planning to send out some more warning letters about this kind of activity, and if celebrities don't comply, they could face hefty fines or even prison time. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, London. An unusual resident has turned up at a Nova Scotia retirement home. It's causing a bit of a stir and making friends at the same time. Meet Clayton after the break.
Thursday on the early edition, reporter Jesse Johnson takes us to the University of the Fraser Valley. The university has been trying to build a more walkable community in the district around campus. We'll look at some of the challenges. That's tomorrow on the early edition. A popular new arrival at a Halifax retirement home has been a breath of fresh air for the residents. Yes, he's temperamental and doesn't make much noise, but his company has been refreshing a refreshing change of pace. The CBC's Richard Woodbury stopped by the facility and he's introducing us to Clayton the Bird. Joan Madison has a routine she follows every day. Three times a day, she goes and looks for her friend Clayton, a red-billed partridge who is named after his new community. She feeds him bird seeds, and he's especially fond of sunflower seeds. If she's wearing her red coat, Clayton recognizes her. If I wear my black coat because of the snow and rainy, he's reluctant to come to me. So, you know, I'll have to talk to him, and when I whistle, you know, he recognizes me. Chukars are the national bird of Iraq and Pakistan. They can also be found in some arid parts of the western U.S. Clayton can usually be found in the courtyard that is at the center of the complex's buildings. While Clayton may be a long way from home, he's being treated with Nova Scotian hospitality at his new home. As winter approached, there was concern Clayton wouldn't fare well, so a call was made to Hope for Wildlife about housing him. The only issue was he needed to be captured. He's been very difficult to catch. We've had people running around this property on more than one occasion trying to catch him. And it turns out that he seems to be doing okay so far in the winter. So we decided that if he wants to stay, we'll let him stay and we'll continue to feed him and look after him and uh, give him places to take refuge. Clayton's become such a beloved part of life at the complex that they even have a home for him. So we bought him a small dog house. <laughs> and uh, so it has a nice opening, just his size, and we put some nice hay bedding in there and some pine chips with some bird seed. And uh, not sure if he's gone in yet, but we're just trying to find the right place for it and, and then hoping that he'll find some refuge there when the weather gets really cold. Clayton is welcome to stay at the facility as long as he wants. He makes the residents happy. Richard Woodbury, CBC News, Halifax. He's it's, so cute. He's very cute. Looks like he's bulked up, though. He's in that last it, shot. Maybe, really, maybe he's yeah. just. Yeah, we all put on some winter weight. They're they're feeding him <laughs> extra well. <laughs> um, okay, so I took some notes. Oh, yeah. of course, Mike always takes notes. Uh, normally found in Iraq and Pakistan mm -hmm. and some arid. I don't know. That seems pretty wayward to me. Those right? are your notes. Well, yeah, my notes. Red billed partridge. <laughs> so what's he do? I just, wayward Iraq. Wayward, 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 I, just, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> all Not right. Very thorough. For Clayton. Yeah, not poor Clayton. He oh, seems fine. fine. He's he seems good fine. Time. Everybody's happy. All right, you can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Maybe you'll even find, find uh, more pictures of Clayton on there. Maybe. Dan Burrett has your next news after the National. Have, Have a good, good night. night.